United States and Canada find themselves in an increasingly interdependent international system. In the United States, we will have our elections on November 8th. What are some of the issues that we are looking at? Well, certainly the competitiveness issue has come to the forefront. Can the United States continue to be competitive going into the 21st century? Or are we losing our competitiveness? Are we heading in the same direction as Great Britain? Some Americans are beginning to, to have second thoughts. And of course, competitiveness is a buzzword in Washington, D.C. these days. We worry about government deficits. We wonder, how will we pay off the debt, the government debt, which will reach $2.8 trillion at the end of next year? A government debt which has tripled over the past decade. A government debt, when divided among all the Americans, will leave each, each of us with an 11,000 share of the total debt. How about the trade issue? Why has the United States racked up $650 billion in, in red ink and merchandise trade over the past five years? Why do only 250 U.S. firms account for almost 80% of our entire export activity? And why are there 70,000 other firms out there capable of exporting, having products which are in demand on international markets but are not exporting at this particular time? And how about the external debt issue? At the end of this year, the United States will owe foreigners about $500 billion more than they owe us. We are the world's number one debtor nation. Our debt is greater than the combined IOUs of Brazil and Mexico and Nigeria and Venezuela and Poland. And it continues to grow. So here we stand now as the world's number one debtor country. While for most of the period since 1914, we have been the world's largest creditor nation. So here we, we gather to talk about the United States and Canada. And in actuality, we're talking about the world's number one and number two debtor nation. What does this mean in the future? What does it mean for cities and states and provinces in North America? We also are concerned about environmental issues, ozone deterioration, green, the greenhouse effect, acid rain, other types of air and water pollution, and how the solutions to these problems now go far beyond national boundaries. We cannot solve these problems in Washington. We can't solve the problems in Ottawa. They demand international cooperation, unprecedented international cooperation. How about strategic issues? We now have strong support in the United States for superpower disengagement and gradual disarmament, both bilaterally and multilaterally in terms of NATO and the Warsaw Treaty Organization, as long as the disengagement and gradual disarmament seems to be logical and verifiable. You have strong support among the American people today. And then how about this investment issue? Direct investment, meaning giving a, uh, an investor in one country a controlling interest in a firm in another country, it has now become a very contentious issue in the United States. It has entered into the presidential debate. We in the United States have gone from having $13 billion in foreign direct investment in 1970 to $83 billion in 1980 to about $300 billion at the end of March of this year. Books are out now talking about the potential dangers of direct investment, such as Sue and Martin Colchin's book, Flying Into America. We now find more than 3 million Americans work for foreign-owned enterprises in the United States. We find, for example, that 5% of all the civilian jobs in Alaska are provided by Japanese firms. And 12% of all the jobs in Delaware are furnished by foreign controlled enterprises. We find that 46% of the commercial property in downtown Los Angeles is foreign owned. And 39% in Houston, 32% in Minneapolis, 19% in Denver. Over one half of the 60 largest hotels in Waikiki are Japanese owned. Foreigners own over one half of the U.S. cement and consumer electronics industries, four of the ten largest chemical companies, 
and a sizable and rapidly expanding percentage of the machine tool and book publishing industry. <coughs> in all, foreigners have titles to over $1.5 trillion in assets in the United States, with 20% of all banking assets now in foreign hands. And if we were to look at a who's who of Americana companies, products, Baskin Robbins, Carnation, Jericho, Spiegel, TV Guide, Alpha Seltzer, Bloomingdale, Saks Fifth Avenue, Firestone, they're all among the foreign owned companies and products. And if Grand Metropolitan's bid for Pillsbury is successful, both Burger King and the Jolly Green Giant will be transferred into foreign hands. Interesting issue. Becoming more controversial on Capitol Hill. The editor of the Business Week insists that Japanese investment activity in the U.S. must be watched very closely, claiming that, quote, Japanese influence is more pervasive, more visible, and much larger than that of other countries. Adding that, watching a foreign competitor manipulate our levers of power so adroitly is to this company. Former CIA Director William Casey referred to Japanese investments in the U.S. high technology sector as quote-unquote Trojan forces. Of course, the mayor of Honolulu recently stated that he wanted to have the legislature, the state of Hawaii, uh, put a ban on Japanese investment in residential property on the main island, claiming that uh, the average Hawaiian could no longer afford to buy a house. Technology transfer issue, Fujitsu, Fairchild, semiconductors. The government stepped in, basically the Defense Department to put pressure on, and Fujitsu had to back off from acquiring Fairchild Semiconductor. And the irony of the situation is, of course, that Fairchild Semiconductor was already foreign owned by Schlumberger of France. So what is happening here? It is highly reminiscent of what occurred in Europe in the mid-1960s when Jean-Jacques Seven Schreiber wrote the book Le Défi Américain, The American Challenge, warning the Europeans that if they did not wake up the third largest industrial power in the world after the United States and the Soviet Union would be U.S. enterprise in Western Europe. It is also reminiscent of Canada in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, as we found cropping up around Canada, independent Canada associations, pressure to limit foreign investment, leading to the creation of the Foreign Investment Review Agency. Is this going to happen in the United States? Do we anticipate that there will be legislation passed at the national level, level that might uh, restrict foreign direct investment? But how do state and local governments view the issue of foreign direct investment? That's what we're going to look at. Now, in Canada, of course, there will be a national election on November 21st. And what is the number one issue of concern? The Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. If the Progressive Conservative Party of Brian Mulroney is successful in winning this election, electing a majority to the House of Commons, then there will be a free trade agreement with the United States beginning next January 1. However, if the Progressive Conservative Party does not attain a majority, there will not be a free trade agreement. Because the two major opposition parties, the Liberal Party and the New Democratic Party, are vehemently opposed to the free trade agreement. In debates that were held this week, debates that really sort of uh, put to shame our so-called debates, in, in debates this week in Canada, six hours of debates, three in French, three in English, the free trade agreement was the number one issue of discussion, with opposition leaders basically saying that if it goes into effect, Canada will become a junior partner of the United States, and indeed, Canada may eventually be absorbed into the United States. Very, very delicate issue. Very, very emotional issue. Again, Canada's place in the world as we move into the 21st century. Will it remain competitive? What are Canadians willing to, to do in terms of making their country more competitive economically? Can Canada compete? How will Canada face up vis-a-vis -vis the European community, which at the end of 1992 hopes to have a true common market, a 
common market with 320 million consumers, a common market with a GNP which will rival that of the United States. How will Canada do in future competition against Japan or against the newly industrialized countries of Asia? How will it fare within the GATT organization, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, 96 member organization which is there to liberalize trade? Will Canada's voice be heard? Again, lots of questions in terms of international competitiveness on both, <coughs> sides, both sides of the border. Well, we want to look at the sub-national dimension in both these U.S. and Canadian federal systems. That's what we'll be doing over the next couple of days. Because even though we're having second thoughts on Capitol Hill about foreign direct investment, and even though Ottawa at times has second thoughts about new foreign direct investment coming into Canada, the states and provincial governments, with very few exceptions, want foreign direct investment. And some of these subnational governments are very powerful economic actors. California, for example, produced over $530 billion in goods and services in 1986, ranking it as the sixth largest economy in the world, ahead of such nations as Great Britain and Italy and Canada. New York and Ontario would also rank among the top 11 nations in the world in terms of the production of goods and services. In terms of trading partners, the United States exports more to Ontario than it does to Japan, more to the western province of Alberta than it does to France, more to the western Pacific province of British Columbia than it does to China. The importance of subnational actors, economically, politically. These subnational actors are now spending hundreds of millions of dollars yearly to attract foreign direct investment. So here's the flag going up in Washington saying maybe we better review this tremendous upsurge in foreign direct investment activity in the United States while at the state level and at the municipal level, they want all the foreign direct investment they can get. Two-thirds of the states have now opened 90 offices overseas. That compares with four states having offices overseas in 1970. Seven of the 10 provinces have opened more than 40 offices abroad. <coughs> provinces, I believe, are actually more involved overseas than their U.S. counterparts. Indeed, in a study which I completed on the four western provinces and the 13 western states, we actually found that Alberta, on a yearly basis, uh, sponsored more trade missions overseas than the 13 western states combined, and that includes California. More American states have opened offices in Tokyo, 27, than in Washington, D.C., 24. 45 governors directed at least one trade mission abroad over the last 18 months. And cities are also involved, as I will discuss in terms of Los Angeles and San Francisco. But what do the cities want in terms of foreign direct investment? They would like to replicate what has occurred in Spartanburg, South Carolina, a medium-sized city which over the past decade and a half has attracted over 40 <coughs> foreign firms from 12 different nations, making more than $1 billion in new investments and creating more than 7,000 local jobs in the Spartanburg community. That is the model for many American cities and many Canadian cities. But why the thirst for international involvement by state governments, by provincial governments, by local governments in both countries? Let me give you a laundry list. Number one, the imperatives of complex global interdependence. State and local governments understand that decisions or events which transpire overseas may impact upon the well-being of their constituencies. So for example, if OPEC is able to get its act together and increase oil prices, that will be viewed negatively in many states and many provinces. It will be viewed negatively on Wall Street, but it will be viewed very favorably in Texas or Louisiana or Oklahoma or Alaska or Alberta. Those subnational units, which are dependent on oil for a good share of their revenues. If the European community decides to increase agricultural subsidies or to place bar 
superior to the importation of agricultural goods. That will impact upon California. That will impact upon Kansas and Saskatchewan as they may no longer have the same access to that large European market. If subsidies can increase in the European community, that may make it more difficult for American states to sell their products to third markets. So these can all impact upon the well-being of their constituency. And this is what has prompted California now to set a representative to GAP in Geneva to publicize the desire of the state of California. A second reason, the uneven economic benefits of federalism. We have had a very prosperous economy in the United States over the past few years. We've created about 17 million net new jobs since the end of 1982. Tremendous job creation record. But this has not been spread evenly across the United States. Indeed, we find that since 1980, Almost 80% of the entire economic development has taken place in California and along the eastern seaboard. The economic development growth rate along the east coast of the United States and the west coast of the United States has been almost three times as high as the economic development growth rate in the interior of the United States. So while a, while a Washington, D.C., or a Boston, or a New York, or San Francisco prospers, when there are lots of for higher signs out, where you can go to Burger King and earn 6 to $7 per hour, we find other parts of the United States have, have not progressed significantly in the economic realm. Indeed, we would find that in Texas, there has been a significant loss of jobs over the past several years. Or to bring it down to the city level, Houston lost 160,000 jobs following the first major drop in oil prices in 1982 and 83, and an additional 130,000 jobs after the 1986 oil plunge. Dallas, its commercial property values are now at 80% of the value of 1984. Denver lost a net 11,200 jobs in 1987. I should say people, they just left. A net loss of 11,200 people. Home prices are down 15 to 20% since 1984. And commercial rental rates in downtown Denver are down by about 50% since 1985. So those areas that are dependent on raw materials, on agriculture, on traditional industry, have been hurt. Even a city such as Milwaukee, which 25 years ago, 25 years ago, had about one half of its jobs being in the health, relatively high-paying blue-collar field. About one half of all the jobs were in the relatively high-paying blue-collar field. Today, it's down to less than 30%. Less than 30% fit that category in Milwaukee today. Why? Well, much of the change is attributable to stiff import competition. So parts of the nation may prosper, while other parts may suffer significant and it's the same in Canada, if not more so. The heartland, hinterland dichotomy is alive and well. You have the province of uh, Ontario, particularly Toronto South, which is booming. You have other parts of Canada, particularly the Atlantic provinces and the Western provinces, which have suffered significant problems over the past several years, even during a time of overall national economic so the uneven economic benefits of federalism with the subnational government units say we've got to help ourselves. And often they're now turning overseas to try to bring about greater investment, greater export promotion, greater tourism promotion. Third on our list, electoral consideration. If you happen to be a, an incumbent, you generally want to be reelected, whether you're in the United States or Canada. And if you want to be reelected, you know that the voters will be most concerned about pocketbook issues. How are they doing economically? If you want to be reelected, you need to create more jobs, not, and also uh, 
diversify your economic base so it becomes more recession-proof over time. But what if you're having problems at the municipal level? How about New York City in 1975, which was on the verge of bankruptcy? How will the incumbent do in that case? Or how about Rio de Janeiro, which in September of this year declared bankruptcy? How will the local leaders do in that case? Again, you must look out for the well-being, the economic well-being of your local constituency if you want to be re-elected. And increasingly, we see these subnational governmental leaders turning abroad for help. Number four, a decreasing reliance on transfer payments in both the United States and Canada. In real terms, less money going to the subnational governmental level than in the past. In the United States, about one-third less money in real terms from 1980 to 1988. And so if there's less money being transferred from the national capitals to the state and local governments, you've got to make up that shortfall somewhere. And you try to do that through increasing economic activity. And again, you go abroad to try to attract new investment, new job opportunities, new export opportunities. Number five, the expanding scope of subnational governments. When I meet with potential foreign investors, I say, don't, don't think that everything is cut and dried in Washington, D.C. That is, if you get past the, the process in the federal government, that you're, you're home free. I say, you better pay attention to what subnational governments are doing at the state level, at the local level. Because did you know that in the early 1980s, over about 100 times more laws were enacted at the state legislative level than at the congressional level? Governments at the subnational level are expanding. More legislatures now meet on a yearly basis than ever before. They have expanded their staff assistance. They're passing more laws. There's also been a concomitant increase in local governments. More expertise, more growth, and they're now willing to be much more active in terms of determining the policies which will govern the business community. Number six the quest for revenues, the quest for revenues. Again, this sort of goes hand in hand with the notion of decreasing transfer payments from Washington or from Ottawa, but they need more revenues. And that's part of the reason why we find that 28 states have now initiated lottery in the United States, lottery. And several of the Canadian provinces trying to come up with more money. Most states, must have balanced budgets. So they've got to increase revenue if they want to increase expenses. Again, often they look overseas to try to attract new businesses into their areas of jurisdiction to help, to help bring in new revenue. Number seven, global linkages and the internationalization of production. Global linkages and the internationalization of production. Many states, many municipalities now have easy access to international airports. Communications is easier today than ever before. We live in an internationalized world, communications-wise, transportation-wise. It's also easier than ever before to move people. In 1987, we, we uh, welcomed about 28 million foreign visitors in the United States, a record level. We anticipate 88 will probably be better. So, and also in terms of the internationalization of production, if there is a strike at a GM plant in Oshawa, in southern Ontario, that may lead to a GM plant being closed temporarily in Detroit. It's part of the internationalization of production. You get your component parts from various factories around the world. You have to learn what the repercussions will be of the internationalization of production. Number eight, protectionism. Did you know that our states and local governments can also be protectionist? That 46 states now have some form of buy American and buy local legislation, which gives preference to American firms or even local firms over outside competition. 30 states have anti-takeover provisions. See, a lot of 
of states and local governments depend on one or two major industries, and they'll do their best to protect those two, those one or two major industries. So if you'll see what has happened recently, you'll find that uh, Capital of Canada tried to take over federated department stores. It was successful, but it had to go through a labyrinth of state restrictions <coughs> before that deal could be complete, uh, completed. We found that VAT Industries wanted to buy out Farmers Group, but several states said no. You violate our takeover laws. So what did VAT Industries of the UK, of the UK have to do? It had to raise its price for the, uh, for the stock to make it a friendly takeover before it could gain the necessary permission from the subnational level to continue. Or how about Beezer of Great Britain, its effort to take over coffers? Not only was the state of Pennsylvania opposed, but so was the city of Pittsburgh. They put in many, many barriers to this takeover of a local firm, Coppers, uh, by this UK-based firm. And maybe they were right, who knows, because the number of employees at the Pittsburgh headquarters of, uh, of Coppers, which has now been taken over, that those employees, uh, the, the number are down from 500 to a current 280 to, expected, to an expected 90 next January. Maybe Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh had something you know, they knew something about that, but they felt that there would be an overall net loss of jobs. But states and local governments can be protectionists. And Grand Metz attempt to take over Pillsbury. Watch what happens in state courts, in state regulatory bodies. There's going to be a lot of action at the state level, even though the federal government says it's fine, Grand Metz, go ahead and take over Pillsbury if you can. At the state and local level, there will be many barriers put in the way. Nine moral issues, why the state and local governments are more involved internationally. Moral issues, believing that they must take a stance on some international issues. After the uh, downing of the Korean airliner plane in September of 1983, several states, some communities, put a ban on the sale of Soviet spirits within their areas of jurisdiction. Several states now have disinvestment policies towards South Africa and local governments as well, as I'll discuss. Governor Dukakis just lost a case in the courts a few days ago in Hills Court. See, he tried to uh, prohibit his National Guard troops from taking part in exercises in Central America. And four other governors joined with him, basically making the argument that the National Guard troops are under our jurisdiction. We don't want them taking part in exercises in Central America. But the federal government stepped in, both courts and Congress, to stop that. But again, stances on issues. Number 10, constitutional ambiguity. Constitutional ambiguity. Basically, if you read the Constitution of the United States, you would think from the Commerce Clause, from the Supremacy Clause, that the U.S. government is in control of foreign commerce. And that, I believe, is actually true. But in terms of its application, the states, the local governments have a great deal of flexibility available to them, room for maneuverability to do much of what they want to do overseas. And sometimes what is constitutionally permissible and what is politically feasible are two different things. Ronald Reagan had the opportunity to step in and say unitary taxation is not good. States should give it up. It violates U.S. tax treaties. It's a form of double taxation. But Ronald Reagan happened to be the governor of California when unitary taxation was brought in to California. <clears throat> didn't want to pay the price, the political price, for taking on California or other states. So again, sometimes what may be constitutionally within the realm of the Ford, uh, federal government's jurisdiction, sometimes people on Capitol Hill or in the White House don't want to pay the political price to, say, desist from this activity of state governments or local governments. And last on this list, economic diversification and infrastructure modernization economic diversification and infrastructure modernization. We're going to be looking at cities. And many of the problems that will face our societies over the next several decades will be centered in the cities as they try to provide for the people. We find that in terms of around the world, you know, there's continued population pressure on many cities. You know, 1987 population growth around the world was the greatest ever. And we talked about decreasing population in, in the advanced industrial societies, but we had the greatest population growth ever in 1987. 
In Asia, for example, between 1980 and 2000, <coughs> there, the cities with at least 1 million people will more than double, from 69 to 148. 11 of these cities in Asia will have a population over 10 million. In the USA, more than 180 US cities have populations exceeding 100,000, and 117 metropolitan areas have populations exceeding 280,000, ranging from Visalia to Larry and Porterville area in California to the 18 million people in the New York City metropolitan region. The US Conference of Mayors this week released a report saying, how are we going to take care of our people? We think that 28.5% of our children living in the central cities are living in poverty. 28.5% compared to a national average of 20%. To say that we're, we face a 38% high school dropout rate in 1988. 38%. <coughs> they have a much higher infant mortality rate than the national average. So how are they to cope with these significant problems at the metropolitan area, the metropolitan level. And they are looking for the opportunity to diversify their economies, to modernize their infrastructures in order to provide the economic wherewithal to allow to, uh, more services to the local people. Well, in terms of the cities, let me just say a few things about San Francisco and Los Angeles, since those are the cities I visited. We have in the United States about 83,000 distinct government groups. 83,000, up around 3,000 in the past decade. And of these, about 36,000 are local governments, which collectively make more than $200 billion in investments and $300 billion in expenditures annually. That's a lot of money on an aggregate basis. About 1,000 of these local governments are actively involved in international programs, mm -hmm. about 1,000. For example, approximately 830 U.S. cities have established sister cities relations with 1,300 municipalities in 89 countries. We're going to hear uh, a report of that uh, later on. Mr. Oakman, representative of Sister Cities International. Nearly 200 have designated offices or parts of offices for international trade, investment, tourism, or cultural exchanges. About 200. Seattle, for example, has established a five-person office of international affairs and spends about $230,000 annually for its operation. <coughs> We're going to hear a report about Seattle. San Antonio has an office of international relations within the office of the mayor and spends about $140,000 per year in public and private funds. Philadelphia opened an inter international division in its commerce department in January of 1984. Over the past four years, this division hosted 52 buying and investment missions from abroad and helped to organize 26 international missions for Philadelphia-based firms. Cities are also engaged in municipal foreign policy, and we're going to be looking at that. What does that mean in terms of the nation speaking with one voice? We find that eight, 900 local governments have passed nuclear freeze resolutions. We have 120 cities and counties which ban nuclear weapons production within their areas of jurisdiction. We have about 120 cities which have refused to cooperate with aspects of the Federal Emergency Management Agency Civil Defense Crisis Relocation Program in the event of a nuclear war. These cities have basically said nuclear war, war is unthinkable. We're not going to cooperate with you in coming up with a civil defense plan. More than 70 cities have divested billions of dollars from firms doing business with South Africa. Several cities do not permit companies that do business with South Africa to bid for city contracts. More than 20 cities provide sanctuary for illegal immigrants from El Salvador and Guatemala, ordering their local police not to cooperate with agents from the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. In terms of Los Angeles and San Francisco, Los Angeles has 3 million people in the metropolitan area, another 9 million people. So the Los Angeles region produces $250 billion annually in goods and services, which would rank it as the seventh largest, 11th largest nation in terms of productivity, ahead of Australia, Switzerland, and India. Los Angeles. 
The four county region centered in the Los Angeles basin has more people than all of the states <coughs> except California, New York, and Texas. Los Angeles. It's the second major international banking center in the United States after New York City, with about 100 foreign banks having facilities in the city. Thanks to trade with other Pacific Rim nations, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach combined to be the busiest in the United States, with the values of goods passing through these ports in 1987, adding up to almost $75 billion. 17 Fortune 500 industrial headquarters and 15 Fortune 500 service sector headquarters are found in Los Angeles, compared with the 98 and 17 respectively in New York City. Population-wise, Los Angeles has been the fastest growing major metropolitan area in North America and in Europe. With the, metro with the metropolis stretching across the five-county region and 157 city jurisdictions. Population growth runs counter to the traditional waspish roots of the United States. Most of the population growth in recent years in Los Angeles has come from non-European sources. The Los Angeles metropolitan area has the largest Mexican population outside of Mexico, the largest Korean population outside of Korea, the largest Filipino population outside of the Philippines, the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam, the second largest Chinese population outside of China, and the second largest Japanese population outside of Japan. It has indeed become an international city. With such a diversified population, sister cities' linkages have been an actual for Los Angeles, with 14 thus far established. Another 68 foreign cities have asked for pairing with Los Angeles, but the mayor's office first wants significant grassroots and private sector support before entering into any new arrangement. Billboards have been posted in the city stating, why aren't you a member of the sister cities committee? Twinning has also viewed increasingly for the economic benefits <coughs> which might accrue to the city. Following the adage, friends tend to trade with friends. Foreign direct investment is important to Los Angeles. Eight of the nine major Japanese automobile companies, plus Korea's Hyundai, have established their U.S. headquarters in that region. Japanese companies alone contributed over $200,000 to Mayor Tom Bradley's <coughs> mayoral and gubernatorial campaigns over a four-year period, Japanese companies alone. About one half, half of downtown commercial property is foreign control in Los Angeles, and nearly 75% of the largest downtown office buildings are now in foreign hands, up from 25% less than a decade ago. Trade and tourism are vitally important to Los Angeles, 600,000 jobs, the metropolitan area are dependent on import and export activity. More than 3.3 million foreign visitors stopped in Los Angeles in 1987. And tens of thousands of jobs in the metropolitan region are directly linked to the tourism industry. An international affairs office has been opened. It has a separate budget, three full-time personnel, a consultant on soft money, and some interns from local universities. It works closely with the Mayor's Office of Protocol, the Sister Cities Committee, the Mayor's Office of Small Business Assistance, and with the African Task Force, which was set up by Mayor Bradley. It's also participating in the pilot program of the U.S. Export-Import Bank to facilitate funding for exporters. And we'll talk more about that today. It's another person here from the U.S. Export-Import Bank. Mayor Bradley is a strong advocate of Los Angeles' international role believing that the city has an obligation to speak out on such issues as foreign trade and immigration policies, proliferation of nuclear weapons, and U.S. relations with South Africa. And in the paper, I go over the various contacts that have been made by Los Angeles internationally. For San Francisco, it's probably the, the city with the most controversial policies. You know, other than Berkeley across the Bay and Burlington, Vermont, San Francisco has the most notable reputation for taking controversial stances on foreign and domestic policy issues. In non-binding referenda, city voters urged Washington, D.C. to disengage U.S. military personnel from Vietnam in 1969 and from El Salvador in 1983. San Francisco's retirement board has divested $337 million from businesses operating in South Africa and barred these businesses from bidding on municipal contracts over $5,000. The Board of Supervisors in San Francisco 
instructed the police not to cooperate with the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service agents in tracking down illegal immigrants from El Salvador and Guatemala. The board opposed the nuclear arms race and asked the Pentagon not to board the battleship Missouri and its cruise missiles at the San Francisco Harbor. The board also paid for the printing and distribution of nuclear freeze pamphlets to every city resident. And following the KAL incident in 1983, the board voted to condemn the Soviet action and to kick the Soviet consulate out of town, an action which was never carried out. In contrast, the office of the mayor is much more mainstream, trying to bring in new economic activity in, into uh, San Francisco. The mayor's off and off, office often dissociates <coughs> itself from the foreign policy related resolutions passed by the Board of Supervisors, and economic development is a major priority. And in the paper, I talk about what's being done to try to bring in new foreign direct investment. I talk about some of the problems faced by San Francisco. They attract potential investors, and the investors wind up going to Oakland or other parts of Northern California because of better prices in terms of land values, taxing policies, etc. In addition, San Francisco has set up 11 sister cities partnerships. It renews the partnerships every two years with a memorandum of understanding. And some of these are quite significant. And in the paper, I outline one of the typical uh, memorandums of understanding. For example, with Shanghai today, the city is currently engaged in 65 separate projects. Shanghai has a full-time office in San Francisco. Osaka is opening a full-time office in San Francisco, whereas San Francisco has a law firm representing its interest in Shanghai, and the Bank of, of America will represent its interest in Osaka. I also go into trade investment. Let me say this, both Mayor Bradley, Mayor Feinstein, now Mayor Agnos have been very actively involved internationally, numerous, numerous international trips abroad. Mayor Feinstein, former Mayor Feinstein of San Francisco, went to the Soviet Union with six other mayors, met with uh, Premier Gorbachev, and as a result of that meeting, 36 Soviet citizens have received exit visas to leave the country. But most of the international activity is strictly for economic purposes, to try to bring in new direct investment, to promote exports from San Francisco-based firms, and to bring in new tourism. And I go over various programs. What are my, in conclusion, what are my policy recommendations as we look at these two major cities and what's going on? I think that there's no doubt about it that there's a dire necessity to think globally and to act locally in an age of complex economic, strategic resource and environmental interdependence. I think we need to work on an export partnership in the United States. We need to have the federal <coughs> government, state governments, and city governments working together. There is simply not enough cooperation, as I document in the paper. The export import to the bank project is a good first step. We need more cooperation among all levels of government if we are to get out of the terrible trade doldrums that we have been in as a nation. Also, I say we need to do more in terms of tourism cooperation. We overlook tourism. It's now the second largest employer in the United States. It will be the first largest employer by the year 2000. We need to do more in terms of cooperation with all levels of government in the area of promoting tourism. I also talk about the delicate investment dimension and uh, make some recommendations there. I do conclude, however, that I anticipate state and local governments will continue to do their best to attract new direct investment into their areas of jurisdiction. I also think we need better institutional continuity. We need offices set up at the municipal level which can transcend a change in political leadership that can go from mayor to mayor and still maintain vitality and continuity. On the other hand, there's no doubt whatsoever that political leadership is a necessity if these programs are to succeed. The political leaders must support them 100%. And last thing, I ask for more sensitivity at the national and grassroots levels. I have no problem with city officials speaking out on issues. They have the right to do that. I have no problem with the local voters making their feelings known. On the other hand, I do have problems with uh, efforts or decisions being made that will not allow cooperation with duly authorized federal officials. I think that there's a fine line, and some cities have stepped over that line. We need to speak with one voice as a nation. We need to have uh, true continuity and uniformity in terms of laws in certain areas. But on the other hand, I also think that Washington must be much more sensitive to the needs of state and local governments in terms of conducting international economic relations in particular, also in terms of decisions that are, that are made in terms of bond, bond policies, whatever, to take into account the problems faced by state and local governments. So what will occur in the future?
future 